Hi, everybody. Saying hello to our friends in China. And uh, if anybody wants to say hi, say hi. 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 Hello. Hello. <laughs> hi. <laughs> this is Sunday. It is uh, January the 13th, uh, 2013. And we are here today. Uh, we're going to be doing a lesson today. And the title of the lesson is Our Purpose. Our Purpose. Um, you think of the word purpose and you think, what is purpose? What, what is it? And you know, if you look up the definition of the word purpose, it will say it is the reason or the intended result of something. That's a purpose. So it's like, well, what is my purpose in studying? Well, it's so that I'll pass my exam. What is the purpose of my, of my, uh, Recital, you know, well, it's to complete the qualifications required for that to happen. What is the, you know, so everything that we do has a reason. It has a purpose. It has an intended result to it. So <laughs> our purpose, we all have many purposes in many different areas of our life. And uh, our pur the purpose for something can be something that we do or even something that we are so for instance um, like we talked about before I mean what would be the purpose for me running five miles a day or 10 miles or 20 miles well if I was preparing for a race if I was preparing for a marathon I would run and I would run in increasing distances and I would do it as, as efficiently as I could for as long as I could, so that I could uh, approach that race in, in good shape with the ability to race and, and to be able to compete, okay, the best that I was capable of. And the more I prepared for that purpose, the more likely I would be successful, okay? We have other purposes. We have purposes like um, within our own families. You know, why, why do I spend time, you know, um, with my family? <laughs> what was the purpose in me? Like when I decided what kind of job I wanted to take, I tried to find a job that I could work Monday through Friday, like nine to five or eight to five or whatever, and that I would be free in the nights and the weekends to be for what purpose? Well, I wanted to be able to spend time with my wife and my children especially while they were growing up, and I wanted to be able to be actively engaged in church or ministry type of work. And and so since that was my goal, that was my purpose, I did things to that extent. So there might have been many jobs I could have taken. There might have been many different things I could have done to make money to pay my bills, but I would not even consider one unless it could do that. Now, obviously, I would have considered something different if I had to. Like, if I couldn't find anything and I was going to starve, or my kids are going to starve, I would have done anything. But as long as it was possible for me to do that, that's my choice. That's what I wanted to do. And so a lot of times we make choices. We make choices built on our on what's important to us. Um, the, the other day, Mon and I were talking, and we were talking about he was saying that he wanted to know more about God. And I thought, well, that's great. You know, I said, but man, you're so busy, you know, because you have your, 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 uh, you have to practice and you're always busy with your music. Mm -hmm. And he said, but then mom came back and he said, yes, but I'm not a machine. Mm -hmm. He said, that's mm -hmm. not all I do. You know, he says, there are other things that are important and this is important to me. And so I want to make time to do this. And see, that's the kind of thing we all have to do when something is important to us. So if, we, if, if it's important to me to spend time, you know, to get to know God, then I make time for that. If it's important for me to spend time with my family, then I make time for that. Now, it doesn't mean that the other thing's not important. It is important. The music is important. Practicing is important. Me going to work is important. Studying for school and doing your experiments are important. It's not that those things are not important. 
It's just that that's not your entire existence. It's not like the only thing that you do in your entire life is one thing. So in order for us to have a life, you know, that's full and, and not just all one thing, then we have to make choices and we have priorities and we have to think, what is the purpose of this? So then we have to examine our life. What's the purpose of my life? Is the purpose of my life only to make money? Well, if that, if I believe that's my only purpose, then everything I do will be geared to making money. Is it my purpose to be the greatest pianist in the world? Well, if that's my purpose, then I may not do anything but play piano all the time. I might practice, you know, 16 hours a day if that's my only purpose. Okay? And if my purpose is to have a life that's more balanced in one way or another, then I have to decide what balance am I looking for and what's important and what choices do I need to do to accomplish my purpose. So it's every it's something that each of us has to do in our life. And I think sometimes it's important to stop and think about it. Because if I don't stop and think about it, then I won't be running my life, but my life will be running me. Okay? So, for instance, some people, I've known some people like when my daughter was young, she loved gymnastics. And she wanted to do gymnastics. And she was pretty good at it. She wasn't great at it. She probably would never go to the Olympics. But she was good at it, and she liked it. She wanted to do it a lot. And and we had to think about it. And she said, well, I want to go to the Olympics. And I said, well, you know, first of all, she was very young at the time. You know, and I was like, well, I don't know that you can go to the Olympics. But you got to remember, okay, you you got to count the cost here a little. you got to think about it. If you're going to go to the Olympics, that means you've got to be the best of the best of the best. That means if there's, you know, 10,000 people trying to do this event, you have to be among the top two or three in the world to be able to win that medal. So you, you, you can't just be good. You can't even just be excellent. You have to be the absolute best. Are you willing to pay the price for that? If you're going to pay the price for that, you have to remember, number one, do I have the ability to even do it? So you've got to ask your coaches and your teachers, do I have the ability, no matter how much I practice, to ever get that good? Because if you don't, like with me, I mean, if I wanted to be the fastest runner in the world, well, I'm not that fast a runner to begin with. So if I talk to my coach, he's going to say, well, Ken, I'm sorry, you're just not that fast. I can help you to go faster, but I could never help you to be the fastest man in the world. Never, because you're not even close. (laughs) You know, you have to at least have the ability to be able to do it. Okay, So, so when we examine and we make these choices, we have to stop and think about what what are our choices, and is it realistic that we can accomplish this? Okay, the Bible says that God also has his purposes. That God has purpose for everything that he intends to happen. So just like we're called to stop and think about, well, what is it we're trying to accomplish? God does the same thing. Because it says we were created by God in his likeness. So we are his creation. So there's a lot of things in us that are like God. The Bible says God is love. Well, we... We are loving. We know what love is. We know what it is to feel love. It says God is kind. Well, we understand kindness. We've seen kindness, hopefully. People have been kind to us sometimes, and we're kind back to them. See, there are a lot of things about God where we are similar. (laughs) But the thing is, when God talks about his purposes, sometimes What God's purposes are, are very clear to us. We know what his purpose is. And sometimes it's not clear. Sometimes we're not sure what his purpose is. We say, why is he doing this? What's this? What's going on with that? So sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not. Isaiah, who was a prophet, a great man of God, thousands of years ago, wrote 
thousands of years ago. He wrote, for my, about God. Where are you? I, well, I'm just going to read it to you. But it's Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11, if you want to go back and read it on your own. But it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. <clears throat> so the first thing that God is saying here through Isaiah is that his thoughts are much higher than ours. Now, that shouldn't be a big shock to us. Because if there is a God, if he's not just a figment of our imagination, and there is a God, and he created the universe, you would have to imagine that he is much smarter than us. Okay, he would have to be. He has to be much smarter than us. So he's saying right off the bat, he's telling them, look, my thoughts are much higher than your thoughts. And he's giving an example of it. He's saying, think about it. Think about the heavens, okay? Now, in the Bible, they, when they talk about heavens, there's, there's, um, there's three levels of heaven, okay? There's the level of heaven, which is the sky that we can see. In the ancient days, they would look at the sky with the clouds and the rain and the blah, blah, and that would be called the first heaven. Then there's the second heaven. The second heaven would be what we call outer space nowadays. That's where the sun and the moon and the stars, mm -hmm. and, and especially over the last hundred, several hundred years, we've come to realize that the universe is unbelievably big. Okay, way bigger than the ancients thought. The ancients thought there were a few thousand stars, and they didn't even know what the stars were. They thought they were little dinky things that were just up in the sky somewhere. Now we're realizing those stars could be billions of light years away, and that most of them are way bigger than even our sun. We have a much greater grasp of the universe today than they had back then. So the, the but that was the second heaven. Then the third heaven was the heaven where God resides, which is above all of that. That's where God resides when he decided to make the universe. So when God created the universe, he did it from the third heaven, and his whole universe, which is bigger than we can imagine in a million years, that was created by God. He spoke that into existence. So when the Bible talks about, when God says, my thoughts are higher than yours, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than yours. He's saying, I'm much smarter than you. <laughs> he's not saying he's a little bit smarter than you. He's saying, I am so much smarter than you, you can't even imagine. Okay, it would be like trying to, to, to compare our intelligence to a rock. And you'd say, well, a rock is the dumbest thing in the world. It doesn't even have thoughts. I know, God's smarter than that. He is much smarter because between me and a rock, there's not really that much difference compared to me and God. The difference between me and God is bigger than me and a rock. So when he says, my thoughts are greater than yours, he's, he's telling them right off the bat, hey, listen, you're never going to completely understand me. You will never completely understand me. You can understand part of me. You can understand some of me. Just like I can look at the sky and I can see there's a sun. I can see there's a moon. I can see there are stars. I know that they're up there. But my understanding of them is only just tiny little bit. We don't even hardly know everything that's on this earth. And we have a biologist here that will attest to that. Okay? That what we know about biology, they've been studying it and studying it and studying it. They have atomic microscopes and they run tests all day long. Thousands and thousands of scientists all day long. 
for years and years and years, hundreds of years. And you know what? For every one thing they know, there's a million things they, they don't know. Okay, God is unbelievably great. He is so much greater than we are. And he's reminding us, you're only going to understand part a little bit. You're only going to understand a little bit. But then in the same way, he's saying, as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and, and, and go through the earth and fix the plants and everything before it comes back to me. So my words, when I say something, it's going to be like the rain. It's not going to come back to me empty. When the rain goes out to the earth, it has its purpose. And the rain accomplishes its purpose. And God says, when I speak to you, and when my words go out into the universe, it doesn't come back to me empty. Just like the rain doesn't come back empty. The rain goes down and accomplishes its purpose, and my words do also. For us, if we're ever going to really know who God is, on whatever level we can know him, and if we're going to come to know him and love him, we have to be at peace in our heart with the idea that he is much greater than we are. Because if we're not okay with that, we're going to be bitter. We're going to be upset. There are a lot of people that want to pass judgment on God. Say, well, if there's a God, why do you do this? Or why do you do that? Or why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? And they try to pass judgment on God. And they try to assume that they understand all of his purposes and all of his thoughts. But the fact is, they don't. We don't. We only know a tiny bit about what God is doing in life. And so even if we know him and we love him, we have to be at peace with him being Lord. It's like when you're a little kid. A lot of times your parents do something. You have no idea why they're doing that. You have no idea. And sometimes when you're little, you complain. So it's not fair. Why are you doing this? You know, you shouldn't do it. Why don't you do it this way or that way? And we don't think, we don't, we don't get it. And because we don't understand what they're doing, we assume they're wrong. And our parents come back and say, you know what? You don't understand everything I'm doing right now. But know this. I love you. And what I'm doing here is the right thing for you. And you're just going to have to trust me. And God does that with us a lot. There's a lot of things that we're not going to be okay with. We're not going to understand. God uses this, this illustration of evaporation, about the water coming and feeding everything and then returning him, to explain how precise and definite it is that his will and purpose would be accomplished. He's saying it's absolutely going to happen. And the spiritual laws of God, as as real as the physical laws are. But the physical laws we can see and are easy to understand. Now, by the way, just as an aside, when God said, as my word goes out like the rain and flourishes the plants and the streams and returns to me, when we learn that, when we read it now, we know that there's a thing called evaporation, isn't there? We know that it rains, and it fills the streams, and yeah. it helps the plants, and then everything evaporates, and it goes right back up that's into the clouds. That's science. That's, that's science, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what? When the prophet wrote that, no one understood that. Mm -hmm. Oh, no one oh. understood that. The this, Bible, in this book, that's right. The Bible understood it, and the Bible spoke of it. But the people at that time, they didn't know anything about evaporation. All, they knew that it rained, and they knew that it filled the the, the streams and and watered the flowers, but they never understood anything about evaporation. Mm -hmm. The Bible, in effect, was talking about something 
that science would not understand for thousands of years when he makes that statement. But today, we read this statement, and it seems so obvious to us. You say, oh, of course, I know what that is. He's giving us an illustration about rain and, and fulfilling its purpose and returning back into the clouds. And he's saying, in the same way, my word that goes out to the world will not return to me without having accomplished what it did. Mm -hmm. So he's giving us an illustration. But back then, they only understood that illustration partly. Today, we understand it in a very different way. But the same point applies to us today as it did 2,000 years ago. And that is when God has a purpose and he says he's going to do something, it happens. And it happens all the time. So we as people, <laughs> God has a purpose for everything he says and everything that he does. And what he's telling us is all of his purposes will be accomplished. So when he says this is how it's going to be, it's how it's going to be. And there's not anything we're going to do to change it. Again, think of it as a child. Remember when you're a little kid and your parent says, you're going to bed to take your nap at 2 o'clock. And you go, oh, yeah, <laughs> I got news for you. I got a great hiding place. Now, I'm going behind the couch, and you can't see me, and, you know, I'm not going anywhere. And we think we got it all figured out, and we know how to hide from our parents, and we know how we're not going to – my parents' purpose for me, I'm going to get in the way of, because I know better than them, I think, as a child. Mm -hmm. And what does our parents do? Our parents go, no, you're little, and you need a nap, and you think I can't see you, but I can see you, and I know exactly where you are, and I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to put you in bed, and you're going to take a nap. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we think we're really smart, and our parents say, you're really not that smart. You're just a little kid, and I'm a parent. And sometimes that's how God is with us. Sometimes we think we know better than God. And we think, well, I'll just do this and I'll do this and then you won't be able to do what you want to do. And God goes, no. I, what I want to have done is going to get done. And it's going to be done whether you help me or whether you don't. It doesn't matter. It's going to get done. Because if I say it's going to be done, it's going to be done. And there's nothing you or anybody else is going to do to stop it. That's the heart of God. That's the nature of God fulfilling his purpose. So although we have many of our own purposes and our own choices, sometimes our purpose is the same as God's purpose. So there's a lot of times where we want to do something, and that's exactly what God wants to do. You know, we want to be kind. We want to be loving. We want to do the right thing. We want to do what's right. And that's what God wants. And so we're just cool with God. You know, everything's great. Mm -hmm. And then other times we want something different than him. And guess what? He's going to accomplish what he wants with or without our help. In Proverbs 19.21, it said, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. God's purpose will prevail over ours. God will accomplish his purpose for us and with us as long as we trust in him. If we don't trust him, then God will do what he's decided has to happen, and he'll do it anyway. He'll do it with us, or he'll do it without us. But he'll do it. The only issue for us is what we will choose and whether or not we'll be blessed by what we do. So the thing is, again, go back to the illustration of a parent with a child. <laughs> the parent comes and says, Mom, I want you to go, and there's a, so your, your sister spills something on the floor. The floor needs to be cleaned. I want you to go and clean it. Now you can say, okay, Mom, and go and clean it. And she says, thank you, son. You're a good son. And gives you a hug. And you're good. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, no, I won't do that. 
She said, but it has to be clean. Well, I'm not doing it. Okay, she'll find somebody else. Or she'll do it herself. But if it has to be clean, it'll be cleaned. But guess what? Mom will not get a blessing. Mom will not get praise. Mom will not have mom come and give him a hug and say, thank you, son, you're a good boy. Yeah. He's not going to get that blessing because he was not obedient and he would not work with his, with his loving parent. But had he done that, he would have been blessed by it. But either way, that mess is going to get cleaned. It's going to get cleaned one way or another. It's just whether or not mom got a blessing. And we have many examples of that in our life each day. Every day we have things in our lives where we could make choices that would be good and blessed by God, or we can make choices that go against what he wants, and he'll accomplish it anyway without us, even if he has to find somebody else to do it. In James 1, 25, he says, The man who continues to do what's right, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. What we just described. From, and then in Isaiah 46, 11, Isaiah makes an interesting statement. He says, from the east I summon a bird of prey from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. God says in the Bible, that he will bring somebody from a far away land to accomplish what he wants. Okay? He will bring, <laughs> there's another verse in the Bible, which I won't go to right now, in Acts 17, where it says, God determines the exact time and places where we might live so that he can touch our lives. Which means each one of us Right now, not just now, but yesterday, tomorrow, the next day, are exactly where God wants us to be. And he's hoping that we'll come to know him. And he says he'll bring someone from a far off land to help you. I'm from Rhode Island. I'm 1,100 miles away. <laughs> a few years ago, I went to China. We spent a long time. We did lessons in China. You talk to people. I'll do emails. We'll do lessons. I don't care. I'll talk to anybody, anywhere, from any place. Okay? Because I want to get the blessing. <laughs> I want the blessing. God says, I want you to love people. I want to love people. I want you to share the message with others. I want to share the message. Okay? That's my blessing. That's my blessing if I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know what? God's purpose is what? God's purpose is that every man know who he is and come to know him and love him and be saved. He wants every person to have their sins forgiven. He wants every person to have the hope of eternal life. He wants every person to live forever with God. That's his purpose. So the question is, what can I do to help him accomplish that? Whatever I can do to help him to accomplish that will be nothing but a blessing for me. Because I'm helping God to accomplish his purpose. And his purpose is more important than mine. Okay, because his purposes are eternal. They're forever. See, there's so many choices that we make every day that have nothing to do with forever. So many choices. They might make us a better, they might help us get a better job, or they might help us, you know, my purpose to go into the restaurant today is I'm hungry, I want to be fed. So I go into the thing, my purpose is accomplished, and I eat my hamburger, and I'm not hungry anymore, and that's good. All that stuff is good. But is it eternal? Does it last forever? No. What is eternal? What is forever? The greatest gift you can ever receive is a gift of love and eternal life. To know that you will live forever in a loving place with a loving God 
surrounded by your family of brothers and sisters that all love you and all love God and you love them, you can't ask for more than that. You can't, I mean, it's the greatest gift anybody could ever have. And the only one that could ever give that to us is God. A man cannot give that to us. It doesn't come from a man. It doesn't come from a woman. It doesn't come from anything that we'll do on this earth. It can only come from God. <laughs> Jesus said in Luke 16, uh, 19, verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And in John 12, verse 27, he says, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So even when Jesus was praying to his father, just moments before he would be arrested and beaten savagely and nailed to a cross and killed, he was praying to his father. I don't want to go through this. This is not fun. This is horrible. What I'm about to go through is horrible. Should I leave this? And he says, but why would I leave this? This is the reason that I came. He was, he reminded himself that the purpose of his father and his purpose also was to make it so that you and I could be forgiven by, our sins could be forgiven by his sacrifice. And he knew he was the only one who could do it. So he wasn't going to avoid it. He was going to take the punishment. He was going to take the beating. He was going to take whatever bad thing would happen. He was going to take the punishment that was due to us on our sin. He was going to take all of it on all the world onto him. So that we could be with God. The only way he could do that is he had to have a profound love for his father. A tremendous love for us. And a very clear picture in his head of what his purpose was. And when he had that, he could do it. Otherwise, he couldn't have done it, and neither could we. Jesus was always clear in his mind why he came to this earth. It was to bring men and women to his Father through the message and the sacrifice of his life. This was the purpose of Jesus. And for those that love him, it's our purpose also. That purpose is fulfilled first by helping those who do not know God to know who he is. And we do this by talking with others, sharing about Jesus, sharing his message. We can also invite them to worship or Bible discussions to hear the words of Jesus. We can also allow others to feel the love of God through us by our service to them. And I'll offer him the hospitality. So like Mom, the other day when we were talking, you said, well, how can you know this God? How can you know him? And I said, well, we know him by the love that we feel from one another. And you've already felt that. And we also know by hearing his words and just getting to know who he is. And then we decide in our own mind whether this is someone that I love or don't love. And is this someone that I want to put my faith in or not want to put my faith in? But it always has to come down to my heart and my choice. Because God will never force anybody to love him, ever. He'll say, I love you. Now come to know me, and you decide if you love me back. But it's always our choice completely our choice whether or not we will put our faith and love in him. So for me to experience the fullness of life that God has intended to me, God intends for us to have a great life. He created us in his likeness, and, and Jesus said, I came to give people life and to give it to them to the full. He didn't come to give us a cheap life or a short life or a little life or a nothing life. It was worthless or no, he came to give us a full life. That's his intention. 
And if anything gets in the way of this, of that, while we're here on this earth, we have the hope of eternal life. And we can remember that God intends even for this life to be good. But if for some reason it isn't, it's okay because I've got eternity to look forward to. And eternity is this big and this life is this big. So he said, don't worry about it. I got your back here. You're going to be okay with me either way. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to let you go. And I'm always going to be with you. No matter how good or bad you think anything happens here, I'm going to be with you and you're going to be with me forever. If I'm going to be blessed by God, I have to share in his purpose. <laughs> I have to say, God, your purpose is my purpose. What's important to you is important to me. Okay, because you're God and I'm not. God has reached his hand to me. Everybody here in this room has in one way or another had God reach out to them and touch you. In one way or another. If he didn't, he wouldn't be in this room right now. God has touched every heart in this room and reached out to them and, and said, I want you to know me better. I have to show, I have to love other people the way God loved me. And God's going to fulfill his purpose one way or another. He's going to do it with us or he's going to do it without us. The only question is whether or not I'll fulfill my purpose in him. That's going to be the only question that's going to be. So, amen. amen. Hi right, guys. Everybody in China or wherever you are.